your passion for, for this basic human right comes from your experiences living and growing up as a child in Burkina Faso. What do you remember of this idea of water being precious and scarce and something that has to be struggled and fought for? Uh, my strongest memories of my childhood was um, why do we have to walk so far to get the water? Did you have to walk for three hours? You had to walk for three hours? Three hours. I don't do anything for three hours. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you well, do when you're fetching water? Well, you sing on the road. I was with my grandmother, my cousin girls. We sing, we play sometimes. When we get to the well, we're tired, we rest for a little bit, we fill our bucket and we walk back to the village. You know, um, you do what you have to do because what would you do without water? Water enslaved people because they have no choice. This, this is, this is they, they just have to do it. You know, and to me, that is why Clean water is a human right, because we cannot live without it. Without clean water, there's no liberty, you're No, saying. there's no freedom. You can't go to school. You can't walk. Women, women don't have that, that freedom to have the possibility to do other things for themselves and for their children. No woman wants to see their children suffer. They all want to see them rise, become who they want to be. As a 14-year-old girl, you decided to pursue being a model after a very, very difficult conversation with your father. Can you just tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so at 14 years old, my father told me that uh, he won't be able to afford for my education. And uh, all I have was my education to get out of poverty. And around me, I had a lot of girlfriends that the parents was, were giving them to kind of like a forced marriage. Mm -hmm. Like at 14 years old, I just couldn't picture myself doing something else other than go to school. So uh, luckily, people would tell me, you're tall, you're skinny, you can become a model. And I was kind of like, mm. Actually, the first designer that I work with, his name is Pateo. I walk three hours from this area to another one, to another one, to another one. I finally reach his office and I introduce myself. I say, just try clothes on me and pay me so I can go to school. So, How have you used your platform as a, yes. as a model to, to create this change, this drive? A few years ago, I co-founded uh, an organization with a friend, Models for Water. Mm -hmm. I was so excited about it. I was like, oh my God, finally, I will use my platform as a model to help and give back. And um, so we start building the first wells outside then my village. We'll raise the funds and we'll partner with other organizations. Until my friend told me that, I am so sorry, we, we have to stop the organization because, you know, there is a, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. There were times uh, she was in uh, Australia, I am in London, we have to call. It's a full time, you know, uh, work having an organization. Oh my God, I was depressed. Because this was your dream. Oh my God, I was so depressed. That is when I decided to want to share my, star, my uh, childhood story with the world. That's when uh, we came up with uh, the Water Princess. And uh, I wanted to use the funds of uh, my book deal to build the first well in my grandmother village. So. We went on and looked for different organizations that could do that. So we gave the funds to uh, one of the organizations. They say, okay, yes, no problem. We'll build a well in your grandmother village. And uh, finally they say, no, 
We want to build the world somewhere else. I was again hurt. You are dealing with a lot here. This is, yes. I would give up. I, I was so hurt that that's uh, when I decided to, find, uh, to found uh, the Georgie Badiel Foundation because I was kind of like, if I don't stand up for the people, nobody will do. I've not heard of many people turning that many setbacks into a positive, but here you are. You're so honest about how you have suffered and the pain you have gone through. And you are, you, you are not embarrassed or ashamed of, of being poor or your father having to make very tough decisions about your education. He simply couldn't afford it. I am proud. I'm, I would say that I am proud of um, where I'm coming from. You know, because I strongly believe that no one in this world decide on which family they will be born. No one. So uh, it's a grace of God to be born on any family. Now, what is the most important is what you do after. How has your activism changed your experience of, of going back home? Now, when I go to Burkina Faso, all I want to do is to find the solution the solution on how we can bring clean drinking water to my country. Because when I go to villages, I see women like me. I see young girls like me that have to spend three hours, four hours. Some of them sleep on the road just to bring back a bucket of water for their family. At the end of the day, if we really want to solve poverty, we need to start from the basic. And to me, the basic is water. You know, you can't get more than that. The basic is water and life start. This is where life start. What is the hope and dream and aspiration of your foundation? And what does it mean to you to solve the water crisis in Burkina Faso? Well, to me, I believe in one country at a time. This is why my main focus is in Burkina Faso. The population is growing every day. We almost, we're about 18 million and uh, about 60 and more uh, percent of the population don't have access to clean drinking water. That's a lot. Yes. And to me, the way that we can solve it is um, if we can have the rich people help, that would be great. Rich people in the sense that if we have um, powerful countries, around the world that can dedicate at least 0.5% of the GDP uh, to the world, uh, to solve the water crisis around the world. I think that would be amazing. Mm. To many people watching this, they have at least access to a phone or a laptop, which means they are probably not some of the world's poorest just by virtue of watching they you are rich. talk. They are rich in many <laughs> they ways. They are rich. Yes. <laughs> so in, what do you want to tell people watching this with the water privilege that they have? What could we do as individuals to try and f fix and tackle this problem? Water is everything. We can't educate a young girl without water. We cannot empower a woman without water. Water is everything. So as human beings, let's use a sense of compassion to give back, to help someone have the most basic human need, clean drinking water. A lot of people don't even, un they just think, oh, this was a problem of the past. W yeah. Water scarcity, what are you talking about? You know, people used to do that in the 80s and 90s. Uh, we're in Cape Town and uh, everywhere you go, they have been uh, saying how much, you know, they start to run out of water. Yes. How can you imagine a city like that can run out of water? But it, this problem will be global. Quite. It will be global because sometimes we think that it only happened to others. But fortunately not. Georgie Padil, thank you so much for talking to the Doha Debates. Oh my God, thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.